important. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, so I'm here, you know, not only as a practitioner, but as a devout follower of Islam, but on a larger scale, also a devotee of all faith traditions. The, the way I see it is the Buddha put it best that he said, if you want to seek water, you don't dig six one foot wells, you dig one six foot well. So Islam happens to be my one six foot well, but we all draw from the same water. So uh, just in case you all are not aware, Islam is not a, an isolated faith. It's a continuation of the monotheistic traditions of the Abrahamic faiths of Judaism and Christianity. And therefore it is seen as a succession in the prophetic traditions. And what it does is it leans on and relies on the existing traditions of, of Christianity and Judaism, including in the mystical traditions from those two faiths and, and adds its own to it. So I'm not sure how much you guys know, but there are some very important thriving communities within the Jude Judaic and Christian traditions that dwell into mysticism the Kabbalah, the Christian Orthodox, the Gregorian orders, the Franciscan orders. So this is a continuation of that. <clears throat> According to Islam, life as in the prototype Adam um, was made of, Adam was a clump of clay <clears throat> into which God breathed his spirit. The word in Arabic is ruh. So he breathed his spirit and then he became a human being. So that means it's a combination of both the, the physical aspect, the, 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 the mold of clay, and then the spiritual aspect, the spirit of God that was breathed into him. So when we come to worship, there's both the need for the physical worship and the spiritual worship, right? So generally speaking across all faith traditions, you'll, you'll see two types of traditions in terms of reaching the divine, right? When we pray, we are talking to God. And when we read the scriptures, God is talking to us through the scriptures. But from that, there seems to be a spiritual direct connection that seems to be absent in those two usual, those two avenues of connecting with God. So in, in Islam, the, the, there are the five ritual prayers and they're spread across the the course of the day. We call them Salat in Arabic and Namaz uh, in Urdu and, and in Persian. And before, so I sent that article to you folks, hopefully you have some time to, to view it. Before we get to the, uh, the, the prayer itself, it actually starts off with a call to prayer. It's called the Azan. So let's play a clip of the Azan. You'll see some, some interesting things in it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Um, I gotta do this. Clip okay. one. Yeah. yeah, clip one, but I have to share my computer sound. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Clip one. <laughs> Allah, 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 Allah,
you can see that in, in that situation, you see the wide variation of, of the different um, stylistic as well as the different tunes that are used. And it, it, it essentially reflects on the time of day. So you'll see the one at the end of the day was essentially very, very short. And therefore the, the whole idea is to, um, is to get to the end of the day, do their prayer. Many times people are fasting. So, and at the, at the very end of the night is very soulful. It wants to send you into a meditative state, right? So um, that is, um, hang on, let me enter my minimal. Okay, excellent. So that, that's the azan. Now, if you, the, the article I sent, you, you look at the, the motions, the movement included in the prayer itself, right? So you saw standing, sitting, kneeling, bowing, prostrating, lifting arms, folding arms, sub, and all this is in the prescriptive prayer. So this is, you can't deviate from that. It's pretty much fixed. This is the way it is. In addition to that, we also have uh, supplicatory prayers. And many, many times people use the rosary, just like the one in, in the Catholic tradition. And so the rosary has 99 beads, and we take the name of Allah, the name of God, and all these are praiseworthy names, right? And then we meditate on each one of them. So now let's get through what happens after the prayer is over. As a human being, you still feel there's a need to connect to God beyond the formulaic way. And now I'm going to give you a little bit of history so you understand. I'm going to lay, give you the lay of the landscape with, with, with the Muslim community. So right at the, end of, uh, at the end of the life of the Holy Prophet in 632 AD, <clears throat> as he passed away, there was a immediate break in the community. And this was all about succession to the prophet. So one group of people chose the leadership of a gentleman called Abu Bakr, who, well, right now, and that group of people um, right now are about 77, 78%. That's the majority. So they are known as the Sunni uh, Muslims. And they are the ones who chose a leader based on the election of, of, of the community. Of course, it was as a sign of the times, they were all men, and they were all, no, no women were included. And also it was just a group of men. Now, there's another group of people who are now known as the Shia, who actually went back to the life of the prophet. And then on various occasions, the Holy Prophet had indicated and appointed his cousin and his son-in-law, whose name is Hazrat Ali. So, in the traditions that we see of the Sufis, the reason I tell you about this, the course is not about the splits in Islam, but it's about why the name of Hazrat Ali will come up over and over again in a lot of these meditation chants and the Qawalis and a number of the, uh, the musical traditions of the Sufis. So the Sufis actually accept Hazrat Ali as the successor to the Holy Prophet, not only in a physical sense, of, of in charge of the community in a secular sense, but also as the inheritor of the spiritual authority of the Holy Prophet. So the Holy Prophet based on Islam, when he started the first message he received, but again, Islam is not revealed at this point. He's sitting in meditation on top of a little hill outside of Mecca in a cave, deep in meditation. So the first connection is a, is a spiritual connection. And then the angel Gabriel comes and reveals 
the revelation which we call the Holy Quran over the course of 23 years. So the majority, the Sunni, they uh, frown upon and disallow the validity of music in their traditions. And the way they, they see it is that it's seen as a departure from the original way of worshiping. And they call it bidda, which means innovation, and therefore it is invalidated. The Shia and the Sufis do accept music, and the Sufis are very, very particular in, in saying that there is a, a spiritual path that we have to chart beyond the physical to connect with God. Again, remember we talked about human being being made of the, the spirit and the body. So the prayers are for the body and the meditation is for the spirit. And um, the Quran, the, the holy book, is, is to be recited, not just read. And when you do the recitation, a certain type of voice, a, t a certain type of tonal quality is injected in it, and they take it to the next level. So let me just give you some background <clears throat> that the, the spiritual search um, is right under the big banner of Sufism. Because what Sufi means is actually means Wu. And the people who kind of preferred the ascetic life, who wanted to concentrate more on the spiritual search rather than the physical pursuits, they tended to be very simple. They tended to be at, uh, quite poor. And they, they dressed in the, in the lowest garment available there, which was Wu. And therefore, the word Wu, which is Suf, was um, kind of, it's like a blanket term for those who choose that path. So they're known as the Sufis. Now it was always there, but it was kind of underground. Around the eighth or ninth century, again, remember Islam, uh, the Holy Prophet died in 632. So it took about a couple of hundred years for, for this uh, movement to actually come to the surface. So around eight or ninth century it emerged from the, from the, from the underground. I do, I do want to make a point. Sufism is not a sect. It's not independent. I mean, it's not a, a split from, from the other partitions. It is in addition to. So there are Sunnis who are Sufis. There are Shias who are Sufis. The mosque that I go to, there are Hindus and there are Jews who actually are Sufis, meaning that they have their own faith identity, but they also want to add to that by connecting from soul to soul. And this is a vehicle they find convenient or something that makes sense to them. Now, the, the Sufi orders, so they're not sects, they're known as tariqas, and it's like an order. It's just a way of interpret how to connect with God, right? They're, they're numerous and they're very rich and quite complex in their own way. And they go from like Mauritania to China, from South Africa to Bosnia, just because of time constraints, we're just going to focus on two, right? The one in, in Turkey, uh, known as the Mablavi, and then the one in, in the Indo-Pak Bangladesh area called the Kawali tradition. So generally speaking, in Sufi tradition, when you express love to your spiritual master, so there, there are two types of loves, right? The one is called um, Ishq, Ishq is love. Ishke Majazi, which is the love for a human being. Now that could be the prophet, that could be the saint, that could be even for a human being. There, there is love and it can be expressed in these mystical terms. Uh, you could be expressing love for your, for your child or for your spouse. And for those of us adventurous enough, maybe for the spouses of somebody else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the, so that's Ishke. Um, majazi, the, the, the expression of love for a human being. It could be your master, right? The second one is called Ishke Hakiki, which means love for the Lord. So it's going beyond the physical boundaries and now you're connecting to your creator. And then since the creator is somewhat unreachable in physical terms, now you, you're unshackling yourself. You are saying that I am going to go in search of my Lord and I will use every tool necessary, be it movement, be it sound, be it whirling, be it meditation. And you're just trying to use all the senses that God has given you to connect to God. <clears throat> so now let's give a short definition, right? So Sufism, it's essentially a Muslim movement whose followers seek to find divine truth and love through the direct encounter with God. 
and different practices focusing on self-control and both psychological and mystical insights, as well as a loss of self, giving up on yourself and just dedicating yourself to truth is the ultimate goal of mystical union with a God. The basic Sufi teaching is there is no divinity, but one God. And that's the only true reality. Everything else, including ourselves, are just acts. And the expression of his mind through his will and the attachment to the illusion, this world is considered an illusion and, and, and a bloating of our own ego is to be minimized and the spirit is to be given, given more focus and to connect with God. So the Sufi movement, as I said, they're, they're not sects, but they're considered fraternal orders in which leaders train and assist disciples in the mastery of the, of the philosophy or the philosophical principles of that order and its ritual practices, right? So the value of some of these orders is so incredible that they kind of break through their geographical boundaries and go into the larger world. So let's take a look at the first one, which is the Mavlavi order in, in Turkey. Um, the, it's named after its founder, uh, Muhammad, Jalaluddin Muhammad Balkhi, who was from, originally from the Iran, Afghanistan area, settled into a part of uh, Turkey, which at that time was a province of the Roman Empire. That's why the place was called Rum. And this is in 1207, and he died in 1273. So he's known Rumi because he's from the place called Rum. And it is based on, now he was a Sunni, very well read. He was a, uh, uh, a professor of law, and he was a brilliant guy. It's like in his early, mid twenties, he was already a professor. His father was a learned, learned um, author and scholar. And so he, he inherited that. And he was one day walking in the gold market. And again, you know, he's deeply in, in the trance kind of thinking of God and he hears the goldsmith tapping his, um, his instrument to, 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 to craft whatever item he was making. And, and Rumi hears, we'll just call him Rumi. He hears a certain rhythm, a certain sound, a certain resonance. And he says, oh, wow. This is really cool. I, I feel that I, uh, this is speaking to me. And so he starts whirling just a bit and he says, wow, okay, I think I have something here. And then, you know, he says that I look at the smallest things and they're whirling and praying. And I look at the biggest things like the galaxies and the solar system and the planets and they're whirling and, and praying to our creator. So I just join them, right? So he takes the most basic thing, right? From our subatomic level. If you look at our, the atom, there is the electrons whirling around the nucleus. And then he says, well, you know, the world also whirls around its axis. The moon, whirl, uh, the moon also whirls around the sun, um, around the earth. And the earth whirls around the sun. And the solar system are also in motion. He says, well, there has to be something very, very um, divine in this movement. So he just takes that as a vehicle to connect with God. And that's why they're known as those who follow his path are known as whirling dervishes. Dervishes is just mystics. And the, they're connecting through the spinning and the prayers and the meditation, right? Now, what they have are, are essentially two major ways of connecting with God. There is dhikr, which is an Arabic word, which is to, to either to mention or to, to repeat. And so that's the meditative chant. And there is sama, is for the audience to hear, to listen, and then to internalize and to get into that ecstatic mode, right? And it's usually set to poetry and empowering phrases. So usually it starts with a salutation to God, and then a salutation to the Holy Prophet, and then a salutation either to the saints or, or to Hazrat Ali, or something very important that was said. So let's, um, Rosa, let's go with the first um, video. Okay. All right, let's see. <laughs> Not this one, though. 
Oh, second video, excuse the me. The second video, yep, this one, right? Yep. All right, here we go. Values in the hearts and minds of millions throughout the world. Mevlevi ritual dance, or Sema, consists of several stages with different meanings. The first stage, Nati Sharif, is a eulogy to the Messenger of Islam and all prophets before him who represent love. To praise them is to acknowledge and praise God Almighty, who created and sent them to humanity as a mercy. This eulogy is followed by a drumbeat on the Kudum, symbolizing the divine command B for the creation of the entire universe. The Nati Sheriff is followed by a taksim, an improvisation on the reed flute or nay. This expresses the divine breath which gives life to everything. Then follows the Sultan Veled procession, or Devri e Veled, accompanied by Peshrev music. This is a circular, anti-clockwise procession three times around the turning space. The greetings of the Semazin, or whirling dervishes, during the procession represent the three stages of knowledge. Ilmal Yakin, received knowledge gained from others or through study. Ainal Yakin, knowing by seeing or observing for oneself, and Hak al Yakin, knowledge gained through direct experience, Gnosis. During the Sema itself, there are four Selams, or musical movements, each with a distinct rhythm. At the beginning, during, and close of each Selam, the Semazin testify to God's existence, unity, majesty, and power. The first Selam represents the human being's birth to truth through feeling and mind. It represents his complete acceptance of his condition as a creature created by God. The second Selam expresses the rapture of the human being witnessing the splendor of creation in the face of God's greatness and omnipotence. The third Selam is the rapture of dissolving into love and the sacrifice of the mind to love. It is complete submission, unity, and annihilation of self in the Beloved. This is the state that is known as Nirvana in Buddhism and Fana Fila in Islam. The next stage in Islamic belief is the state of servanthood represented by the Prophet, who is called God's servant, foremost and subsequently his messenger. The aim of Sama is not uncontrolled ecstasy and loss of consciousness, but the realization of submission to God. In the fourth Salam, just as the Prophet ascends to the spiritual throne of Allah and then returns to his task on earth, the whirling dervish, after the ascent of his spiritual journey, returns to his task, to his servanthood. He is a servant of God, of his books, of his prophets, of his whole creation.
This is followed by a recitation from the Quran. The Surah or Chapter Mary on the Miraculous Birth of Jesus and His Mission. At the end, by the salute, the dervish demonstrates again the number one in his appearance, arms consciously and humbly crossed, and by this, the unity of God. The ceremony ends with a prayer for the peace of the souls of all the prophets and believers. After the completion of the Sama, all the dervishes retire silently to their rooms for meditation and further remembrance of God. The costumes are symbolic as well. The hat that they wear I think is of camel skin and it represents I think the tombstone of man's ego. And then the white big whirling skirt um, is a shroud. It represents a shroud over the tombstone. And they wear a black cape which they shed and when they take that cape off it's a symbol of rebirth. It's in the dance of the dervishes that this uh uh, this uh, relationship between the head, knowledge, and the heart, feelings, and so forth, and then the body uh, are exemplified in a very dramatic way. The dance, the whirling itself is beautiful because the semazen has one hand extended up towards heaven and the other down to earth, in a sense receiving the blessings and mercy of God and sharing them with his brothers and sisters. Uh, the Mevlevi Dervish traveling around the United States and the world, it offers a taste, no more than a taste, but something very important, that initial awareness that there is something out there to, uh, to be sought, and then we must chase it, and then we must do the work of following. Rumi's message was a message of tolerance and love, and in a world today where men seem to be separated from each other by religious differences, by cultural differences, by color, um, if we were to espouse his message and truly live what he says, there would be no way that we could hate each other. Um, we could do nothing but love each other. Rumi's message was a message of universal love. And sadly, even today, 700 years after his life, we haven't learned it. Rumi's life and works show us that it is not faith, belief, and religion which cause hatred, conflict, and violence but the sins of hatred and greed and other symptoms of the unrestrained ego. And he showed us how the true practice of religion, the purification of the heart, is the remedy for these. In our days, his life and works are a reminder to all that the clash of civilizations is far from inevitable. And they show us how to derive hope, renewal, and reconciliation rather than despair, fear, and enmity from our differences. He invites us to call constantly to mind that we are all one. From God we come, and to God we will return. That we worship the same God who is one. And as I learn more about Islam traditions and theology, I am convinced that we're much closer than we are apart. Come, come, come again, whoever you may be. Come again, even though you may be a pagan or fire worshiper, our hearth is not the threshold of despair. Come again, even if you may have violated your vows a hundred times, come again. Uh, let's play the next one as well. Okay.
This one is about five minutes long. Correct. Okay, here we go. To the beginning. Sorry.
Okay. Aziz? Okay, guys. Okay. So I think I'll, we'll, we'll pause here and, and, be, and let's take a few questions and answers here before we move on to the, to the next tradition. What, what do y'all think? Uh, please un unmute yourself. <laughs> Still can't hear. Um, I think it's pretty interesting that, um, you know, there, there are so many similarities between, you know, Islam and, you know, Christianity and even uh, Judaism as well. It's, you know, something I didn't totally expect, but I'm glad that I'm kind of being educated on that at this point. It's pretty cool. And what, what parallels do you draw there? Um, mainly the parallel of just like, you know, from what I've been taught with my own Catholic upbringing is just, you know, loving one another, having forgiveness and, you know, accepting and things like that and worshiping one God. And even the story of creation with um, the creation of Adam um, and the breath of life into that and the molding from the, the clay in the ground. Um, you know, that was something I didn't expect and it was pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. That's a great observation. Anybody else? Um, I found it very interesting, the clothes that you saw them wear. I don't know if there's like a specific word for what they're wearing, but it's just really interesting how they're very um, like visually appealing and they're yeah. also like just one color and it was very like simple yet like yeah. really intricate. <clears throat> yeah, so yeah, thanks for bringing up that point. So, you know, a lot of these, um, the, the attire and, and the space and the spacing between the, you know, between those who are performing and those who are part of the audience and the, the sheikh, the, their leader, a lot of these evolved over time. And uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, who, who, uh, who was I talking to earlier? Kind of, you know, Delaney. yeah pointed that there was a lot of parallels they could draw from the the other faith traditions so you know this did did not this did not evolve organically um, there was a lot of borrowing and they saw a lot of things that made sense to them and they again there there's no borders meaning there's no claim of exclusivity but it's more of an inclusive um, interpretation of faith that God reveals to all and those who are um, essentially considered uh, blessed will, will heed um, the, the call of, of any avenue that brings them closer to God. And, and you know, th this is obviously one of those interpretations of Islam that is very, very open to everybody without any claims of exclu exclusivity. Um, and so that's also very appealing to me who, because I work in the interfaith space where the, the focus is on, 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 con, um, on conversation and not in converting and just to share the resources. Um, so anyways, um, and anybody else before we move on to the next one? Allison? I really liked the idea of having meaning in all the little nuances of the dance, as well as other aspects of Islamic culture as well. I just found connection in that sort of way that in the way that you're not just praying, you're finding symbolism within what you are praying so that when you are doing it, it can have sort of more of a meaning in that sort of way. Right. And it is the, 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 the movement, the clothing, the, the atmosphere is supposed to supercharge your connectivity and it, it really aids in, in kind of getting you into the spirit. So these are all uh, aspects of worship that are supposed to give you a push or a nudge towards renouncing the worldly and connecting with your, and again, white is the color that's used as a the purification, like a color of symbolizing purification. There's a ton of symbolism out there. So um, any more questions before we move on to the next one? I have a question if there's not other questions from students. Sure. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously thinking about this from a movement perspective and I'm, uh, two things really struck me. One was that when they're like this, there's like an off balance tilt 
to the yeah. body. And I'm yeah. interested in sort of how that works in terms of like the physicalities of balance in the right. spinning. And I'm yeah. also wondering about learning to whirl and um, synchronizing or not synchronizing with the other dervishes that you're whirling with. Cause I noticed yeah. some, some points they're all like sort of synchronized <clears throat> and then at other points they're each doing their own base. And I'm wondering like how much are they supposed to be aware of each other? Um, so let's answer the second question first, the, syn <laughs> the synchronization. That actually comes after a lot of training. So they spend a ton of time coordinating their movements and the movements. And so it's, it's actually a, a training f within yourself to be at a certain beat, a certain uh, speed, mm -hmm. and you're not allowed to look at the other. It's your, your master will tell you that you are, a little bit ahead of kind of the required motion, the, the speed of motion. Mm -hmm. So it's independent, but each one, when they are true to the prescriptive um, speed and, and motion, they all coordinate well. As far as the tilt is concerned, um, there are a couple of different theories, but they may all be true. One is a, um, because we are human beings based on earth, they're saying that's the tilt of the earth itself, the axis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're essentially um, kind of replicating and symbolizing that we are as imperfect as the world itself, yet we're asking for the mercy from top and then dropping it to the bottom. Mm -hmm. The second one is that as we are imperfect, we, we do not stand straight. That is kind of seen as a, as a sign of, um, being equal to the perfection of God in posture. Mm -hmm. So you're mm -hmm. slightly off. Um, and I, I think for those who are dancers, I think it actually helps to be slightly off with, 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 with rotation. Yeah, I was wondering about that because that allows the weight to be on sort of one side and then the other leg yeah, to be circling, I, so it sort of grounds you in a way, as opposed to I this think so. switching I think, back and forth. Yeah, and I think some, you know, the the practical may may actually produce a movement, and then they find it find a way to actually <laughs> sense of it. I, I mean, yeah. I've heard these things evolved over time. Yeah. Uh, there is a lady, um, Michela Malozzi. Mm -hmm. Mich Michela okay. Malozzi, I think her name is. She's a world traveler. She's a dancer. And she goes to different parts of the world and learn how to dance with different communities. Oh, Y'all should check her out. Yeah. She's got her videos all over the place. We just didn't have time in today's lecture. And she gives a lot more. She went to Morocco and she danced with three different Sufi groups over there, including women. Wow. And it's like the only time I've seen her cry because she was so moved by, by the sincerity and how she felt connected. But that's something y'all can do on the side. Um, maybe we can now move on to the next one. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, the next, great. the koali. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, okay. So let's go to the koali side, right? Okay. So you know the koali. Excuse me. I need to get out of. Uh, oh, here. We go. You know what? Let, let's start with the video and then I'll, I'll, I'll fill in. Um, Are you sure? Yeah, let's do that. Actually, it, th this will be a very good uh, foundational uh, video. Okay, here we go. What is Kawali? Kawali is a genre of music found mostly in India and other South Asian countries. Although to most people... I'm sorry, I have to reload. <laughs> it might just sound like a bunch of guys screaming. There's actually a lot more to it. Let's look at how Kawali is performed. First, you have an accordion player. Second, you have the drums, also known as tablers. Then you have those two people who clap. Third, you have the main guy, the vocals, also known as the Kawal. Unlike a, a rock band or a DJ, a Kawali group performs while sitting on the ground or on the floor. And unlike the European style of playing an accordion, in this art form, the accordion is actually placed right on the floor, right on the ground. When a kawali is being performed, 
there has been countless reports of people falling into trance. And this makes sense because of the repetitive nature of the drumming patterns used in a Kavali. This was further studied and proven by Gilbert Ruguet in his book Music in Trance, where he studied African tribal dancers and discovered that they too, a lot of them actually, got into some crazy trance modes. You might not see Justin Bieber busting out any Kawali soon, but a lot of Western singers and Hollywood have worked with Kawali singers on a regular basis. So if you ever want to become a Kawal, make sure that you have 20 years of your life put away. That's exactly how long it took for this famous Canadian Kawali singer. Do you want me to go to the next one also? Hmm? Yes, do let's do that. Yes? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Kavali is a spiritual dimension of Islam. It's the poetry, it's the Sufi message, it's the impulsive improvisational aspect, it's that Sufi message of divine love that fuels the music. In so many ways, the Kawal is expressing what we feel. What ah, sorry. Wait. I knew nothing at all about working in front of What we cannot put into words. What we don't know how to offer. हम जब भी बुजुर्गों का कोई भी कलाम गाते हैं तो उसकी कैफियत अगर होती है तो उसमें बुजुर्गों की दुआ भी होती है और बरकत भी होती है अपने नाम की अपनी मोहब्बत की के जिसम मेहनत से उन्होंने अपने रब को याद किया है जिस अंदाज से उन्होंने अपने रब को याद किया है अपनी मेहनत से अपनी लगन से असल ये सिलसिला ही दुआ का है ये लग जाए पीर की लग जाए माँ की लग जाए दुआ उस्ताद की लग जाए ये तीन रिश्ते जिसने मुकद्दस होते हैं ये इस दुआ की रुकावट नहीं है सीधी दुआ जो है वो ऊपर जाती है और वो We've all come from such different places to find ourselves in this. They saw us as Westerners, not born into their culture, not into their religion, but we came seeking something, and they saw that. I heard them tell me, you know, you're not a woman or a man, you're an artist. So they create that safe space, they create that environment. That's what's really captured my heart, that's captured our hearts. That's the thing that we want to share with the world. Keep going.
So what do y'all think? What do you guys think of this? Maybe we can, oh, go ahead. Maybe we can start with how is, how, what sorts sure. of differences are you noticing between the koali and the whirling dervishes that we just looked at? Right. So actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Let me go and give you some, some kind of background to, to kind of paint the landscape, right? So th there is an Arabic word called qul, which means the utterance of, of the prophet. So the first command that came down essentially told the prophet to utter some of the verses that are, that are iconic in, in Islam, right? And it says, read, read in the name of thy Lord. So qul. So a kawali is somebody who takes that wisdom, puts it into a musical uh, note, sings it, and inspires the audience to also get into that kind of frame to understand what was said to the Holy Prophet by God through the angel Gabriel, and how to interpret it, how to consume it, how to make it part of you. And so what they do is, is essentially repeat. There is a lot of repetition. You take a word, introduce it. And usually it's like a heavy loaded word like God or uh, the, the richness of, of, the, of the revelation. And then they repeat it and they kind of fling it in the air and they tease it out. And it kind of forces you to meditate on that word or that sentence. And then to try to get deeper, deeper meaning, it's like a piece of chewing gum. You keep on chewing, chewing at it to get all the juices out. One thing I have to say is that the existing culture of India at that time, which was primarily Buddhist and Hindu, gave a ton of material in terms of the structure of, of, of the raga, the, 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 the voices, the, the, the tunes and the tonality. And then there are some rules that actually I don't understand because I'm not a musician, but I sing myself. So intuitively I know what it is, but it's a beautiful, rich culture. And there are some iconic people that I should mention just because they were so huge in, in contributing to the richness of the Kowali um, tradition. And there are Amir Khosro, who was a great uh, master of one of the orders called the Chishti order, C-H-I-S-T-Y. So when you have some time, look up Amir Khosro and the poetry that he comes up with. It's just outstanding. And what he did was he took the wisdom that came from the Arabic, Turkic, Turkish tradition, which then as it come towards the Indo-Pakistani area of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, that, that area, it, it passes through Persian and then uh, touches on the Indian languages. And what he did was he fused all of that together. So in one sentence, you have Arabic, Persian, Turkish, uh, Hindi, a fusion of that all. And it just, it is such a great buffet that as, as a practitioner, I just love it. And so around the late 13th century, um, this tradition really took root. And again, they also use the word sama, which is to listen. And then the, the audience. So this is something different with Kawali. The audience is as important as the singers. And the audience actually, they, they become part of the ceremony because they, they get up and they dance and they swing and they sway. And the, you know, there's a lot of clapping, a lot of crying, a lot of uh, getting into the trance-like uh, situation. Now, some of the things that I mentioned earlier, like you know, uh, the, the, the spiritual inheritance of Hazrat Ali as the next master from the Holy Prophet, there is a certain phrase which was, man kumtu mola fa hadha ali, fa ali mola, meaning that whose master, this is the Holy Prophet saying, whose master I am, Ali is now their master. And then there is just the praising of Ali, and it says, Ali mola, Ali mola, Ali mola, Ali mola, that Ali is the Lord. And then there is another one, and you'll hear them all because I'm, there's going to be the next video. La fata ila ali la sayfila sulfikar. That there is no, Ali is the champion of, of helping you unburden all your burdens. So there is a number of different prayers that are infused in this Kawali music, right? So, and then they are sung at Mazhar. Mazhar is a shrine. 
trying to those who are uh, deemed to be icons, or are deemed to be um, very valuable saints to this movement. So in there, where they're buried, a mosque is created and a huge compound is there and people go to pray and to sing the uh, praises. A lot of people, uh, so now I'm, now I'm gonna kind of explain the space itself. It'll be very well fragmented, uh, fragmented, fragranced. So there's gonna be a lot of perfume and flowers and a lot of bright, rich silk clothes, which are then given to the poor who, so if you go to any of these mazars, any of these uh, shrines, there'll be a whole ton of uh, beggars and, and poor people outside, and they're all fed and taken care of and a lot of charities given. So it's, it's a meeting place both to, to give and take and to take care of each other, but also to spiritually uplift and recharge. Um, I think we, before we take Q and A, um, how about we play that last video and then we'll jump into Q and A. You wanna say anything about the last video just to Oh yeah, so the video that's coming up is to me the most important part of Sufi worship because of its focus on connecting to the divine without any human boundaries, without any superiorities, only through this particular passage can you get to God. Sorry. I'm, sorry. Like who's getting a call? <laughs> I'm, I'm part of FEMA and just because of the crisis, uh, there's a number of people that fall under my kind of, I have to report to FEMA about their health and stuff, but okay. I'll take care of that later. Um, so one thing that traditional Sufis, um, it has not been a very, well, it's been a welcome place for, for women to be part of this ceremony, but not as those leading the singing, not leading the prayers, not leading the, the worship part of it. In the last few decades, that barrier has been broken. And there are some wonderful singers, both Hindu and Muslim women who have broken through those barriers. I'm so happy to see that because they were completely, well, we could not, see how much they had to contribute. So there's one name that y'all should take down. Her name is Abida Parveen, and I can share it with you later. There are a couple of other Pakistani female singers who have made, who have broken through all barriers. And it's not because of connections. It's just the power of their voices and how they were able to stimulate people. Um, so the, the video that we're about to see is to me, if I have to paint a picture of what our world and our tribal lines should look like in our, our, our relationship, it is a performance that was hosted at a church, sung by a Hindu singer with artists who are both from, who are from the Hindu, Muslim, uh, Sikh, Christian, and atheist background, all together, Produce, they produced this, this particular event that we're going to share with you all. And it, it essentially takes everything. There's music, there's motion, there's poetry. It's wonderful. Let's, let's check that out and then we can do the Q&A. Sounds good. So we're going to start in just like two minutes in. There's a long sort of introductory period. So we're going to start here. They'll already be going. Hopefully it won't have to reload on me again. It does have to reload.
अली अली हे मन कुल तो अली अली हे मन कुल तो So we have a few minutes of reflection and Q&A. So this was like an iconic version of putting Ali as the doorway to spirituality. And that verse I mentioned, Man kuntu mawla fahada Ali mawla. He's whose Lord I am, this is the prophet saying on his last pilgrimage and proclaiming Ali as his successor. He whose Lord I am, Ali is his Lord now. And the word is mawla. Mawla is various gradations of Lord, meaning it could be your friend, your elder, your spiritual guide. It's, it's, it's a very superlative word. But anyway, so obviously the, the mainstream uh, orthodoxy does not accept this at all. So this is still, I would say probably about one third of the Muslim world um, is, is within this tradition. So, okay, let's have some questions. Unless you have to run across another room to attend another class. Mm. Or common. Um, oh, go ahead. Mm. Oh, um, is there ever a time that they wouldn't wear white or is it always white? Mostly white. Um, th there are certain um, performances where white is not worn, but it's usually um, more of a brighter color. And again, it's just supposed to be an external reflection of your internal state. And white is always an aspirational color. And I think that's pretty much true in most traditions. So yeah, it, generally speaking, it is white. But if you see some of the more orchestrated like worldwide events, you'll see it at a, um, at a global stage. They, 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 
they take care. Um, I mean, they they take privileges with with more brighter and um, uh, festive colors. So, what do y'all think of the performance itself? The movement, the music, the the, the vocals. Mm. Oh, See I how really you went through it. the gyrations. Uh, Brandon, okay, I really liked the lady singing. I was like, okay, like she's. Mm -hmm singing her whole heart out and I was like feeling it over here um I also like like <clears throat> like this like how it was like I'm not I don't want to say contemporary but like like they added like like with the violins and the strings it added different like <clears throat> all the rest of the other ones right there, there was some fusion hey I remember you how you yeah. doing yeah I'm cheerful <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm doing good. Um, the man with the golden voice, yeah. <laughs> oh, stop. Awesome. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> good stuff. Um, yeah, good observation. Absolutely. Yeah, I really like that. I really enjoyed her um, her ministry. Awesome. Anybody else? What might an audience be doing? Like did that performance have an audience for it or was it just for the cinematography no this this had a live audience except it was an interfaith audience so the those who were into the movement themselves were somewhat um restrained mm. In, so normally we would be swooning and dancing and I have actually been in performance where I'm singing and I got so much into it that I couldn't continue. I just broke down crying because yeah. the, the emotion takes over and you don't know how, how, how you're going to react, right? So many, many times we see um, performers themselves kind of losing themselves into what they're doing but the uh, the audience is very very part of the performance and usually they're very close i think this one they had some distance because it was a pretty decent sized church but i just love the the church environment because of of the you know the way the structure is the the, the sound kind of vibrates and bounces back and it was just so gorgeous um yeah but you know, a lot of the participants, I mean, a lot of the artists themselves were not Muslims. So we don't, I can't, I can't, I can't guess what their level of devotion was, but a lot of them were really into it. Mm -hmm. Other comments or thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so in, it was like the first video that we had seen. Um, it looked like in certain parts, I don't, it was like, I want to say it was money, basically, is what it looked like. There was some sort of uh, money aspect or <laughs> things like that. So is it, um, was that part of the donational aspect or is it like a street performance type aspect of donation? Great question. So when it's done at a shrine, the, the performers are essentially the doorway through which the, the appreciation of the audience and the and and those who are part of it is is kind of channeled what they do with that money usually is to pay for the expenses so sometimes you know in in small villages we'll have artists who come from other villages um and you know they may have to spend the night over so the custodians uh, essentially collect that money pay for all the expenses and then they depending some 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 artists actually do this as a living for a living rather so they have to have some some degree of compensation but most do not take anything they'll take like a symbolic dollar or something a lot of it is even if taken given away to to the beggars and the orphans there are a lot of orphans there and especially in war ravaged areas you'll find people with you know limbs missing and a lot of children who are who just don't have enough and so there is, and you know, another faith is the Sikh religion, S-I-K-H. They have, they have daily feeding sessions and nobody is denied, regardless of your faith. It's all vegetarian food, but they also have something like this tradition of singing, uh, you know, to the, to the praise of the Lord. There is a lot of commonality, but back to your question about money. Yes, most, most artists don't take money as a um, 
as, as, as a way to earn a living unless that's all they do. But most of them are there just to express and to, to, to give thanks to the, to the skill that God has bestowed them with, which is their voice or their um, mastery on, on any of the uh, instruments. So yeah, good question. Any other questions? General questions? No, okay. Okay. Shall we thank you then? Uh, you're welcome, this was yes. my pleasure. And maybe we can work on that group from Houston. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good. Because they're really, really good. And they're also an interfaith group. Awesome. Thank awesome. you so much for sharing this. I really, really appreciate it. Thank and I know folks. we all do. It's really um, helpful to be able to see some of these videos, hear some of this music, and get all the rich background from you. So thank you okay. so much. Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate it. You all have Thanks a nice so day. Much. All right. Bye. Stay safe. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Bye.